Welcome back to another episode of Novellio. Today is Sunday, May 16th, 2021. This will be a double in length episode as I will be covering for the missed episode that I did not do yesterday on Saturday, May 15th, 2021. Catching her first glimpse of the castle in which she hoped to secure a position, Catherine was impressed with its corbelled watchtowers, buttresses, and pepper-pot-like roofs on both sides of the gatehouse. The sun was setting and she thought it looked mysterious and beautiful. A man in blue and green livery came hurrying into the courtyard and escorted Catherine and Rebecca into the house. They were eventually shown to a large drawing room to wait for the housekeeper. The later introduced herself as Madame Dubois and had a formal air about her, but then it was a formal household. Catherine stood to greet her and noticed how strange patterns of light came into the circular room from two large French windows, which opened to the room's western side. For some reason, she always remembered those odd patterns of light as the years passed. You must be Catherine, Rebecca has told me, about your predicament, and if you would concede to the position of the lady's maid, we definitely have a place for you here. I'm just concerned that you might consider the, that post beneath you, she said. Not at all, replied Rebecca Catherine, laughing to herself. I have worked in my father's blacksmith shop. I have worked as a governess, and I would never consider any honest post beneath me. Well then, let me take you to meet Monique. She is married to married in a year's time and has much on her agenda. She will be pleased to have someone her age to help her navigate through the social engagements and shopping excursions she'll have on her itinerary for the next ten months or so. Perhaps after that you could tra even travel with her to her new home, as the need for a lady's maid will not cease with her marriage. Catherine felt more relief than she had in the last four days and was not at all resentful about having to take a post. She was determined never to go back to England and the haunting memories there, except to retrieve Clarissa and Matthew. However, she knew she must become established before she could work out a plan to do so. Catherine found Monique a pleasant and vivacious young lady who did not put any on any airs or take a haughty attitude because she was to marry a wealthy Comte. Catherine liked her at once and fell naturally into her role. The vineyards are so beautiful here, she said to Monique one day. Do you think you will miss them once you are installed in your new home? I think now that I will, Monique said, pushing back her long, dark hair. But when I start my new life, I will likely have little time to miss anything. Sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, but Mama and Grammaire are ecstatic with the match and are convinced it will be wonderful. What I want most of all are children. I can't wait to have sons and daughters filling up a nursery, and Andre feels the same. But I still think I will miss Bordeaux. These vineyards are actually, were actually started in the 13th century by Pope Clement V, but of course he was... Bertrand de Goth at that time. The estate has produced wine on this land for four centuries. Catherine expressed her interest, which was not feigned, as she always enjoyed learning about the history of any town, estate, or family. Her favorite time of the day was every evening when Monique enjoyed a walk around the grounds. They played with the dogs who were ever friendly and dropped peas to the peahens and peacocks that constantly strutted across the property. At times, however, Catherine missed Jennifer I and Richard terribly, as well as Sarah, and even Carinza's quiet presence. She often wondered what the family were doing and if they were handling their grief any better than she was, although she doubted it. She tried not to think of Julian, although some days it did bother her conscience that she had left while there was still a substantial rift between them. She remembered the last day when the coach pulled up. She had been on the verge of telling him she was wrong to withhold forgiveness, but then Rook had come to tell her the carriage was there, and she lost her nerve to say anything. It won't matter in a little while, though. He'll soon forget me. He has likely done so by now. It was some time later when the thought came to Catherine that she may be expecting a child. She wasn't sure why she hadn't considered the possibility before, but it had not even entered her mind. She thought if it were so, it would make all the difference in the world. It was a reason to go on, the most joyous of reasons. She literally lived in a cocoon of hopefulness, and even Monique noticed a change in her. One day, she said, you look as if you were expecting news of some kind, and Catherine laughed to herself at the way Monique had phrased her statement. Soon she knew for sure, and although part of her was absolutely panicked, she was elated as well. 
She had lost track of time, but when she calculated, she knew it was so, and guessed that she was further along than she thought. Monique's birthday was the 1st of February. She would wait until after the festiv festivities and then tell her new employer the news. She sat staring at the beautiful curve of the Garonne River, giving herself up to bewilderment, considering what to do now, but at the same time being unable to contain the joy in her heart at the thought of having Robert's child. The girl ran blindly through the woods, tearing through branches and cutting her feet on stones. She fell more than once, but continued at a remarkable pace. She ran as if the devil himself were chasing her and somehow managed to burst through a clearing, at which point she came upon Briarwood property. She stumbled toward what looked like the servants' quarters. Her dark hair was dirty and signs of a struggle were obvious. Suddenly her courage failed her and she ran instead to the stables. Right in a corner where she would almost certainly not be seen, she ducked down low a huddled mass of fear. Meanwhile, Julian and Richard were talking in one of the drawing rooms, trying to determine what they should or should not say to the rest of the household concerning Cromwell's army and what appeared to be the king's inevitable defeat. It is said that many who were once loyal are growing weary of his arrogance, Julian said, and therefore less inclined to fight. How many royalist soldiers have we funded thus far, just between you and I, and to what end? I believe people are deserting because they know the king cannot be victorious. And now it is said that he is appointing the Prince of Wales, the nominal commander of the royalist armies in the West. I somehow do not see him as a man people follow into battle, although it may seem may be treason to say so. Then I am feeling somewhat tutorious myself, Richard replied. When I think of all the death and misery over this stiff and rigid king, whom so, whom so many supported at the beginning, but who has apparently given no thought to all the blood being shed for his sake. I can see why folks are poised to, des to desert. Even if there is a chance of holding Cornwall for the prince, what would we have to do in the end? Become our own country? That's something that always talked of, but never would happen. We know it's hopeless, Julian sighed. Already men in North Devon and Somerset are withdrawing support from the royalists stating that they'd be better off protecting their own homes and families than fighting for a lost cause. I believe they are correct. It is only a matter of time now. <clears throat> and how do we know that the prince will not sail for France any day? If that occurred, Cornwall would have to surrender immediately. We are already practically overrun with parliamentary and soldiers. If the prince does that, we shall have to ex exile as well and help keep help the king and his sons raise a French army to defeat the Roundheads. Thus far, they have been receptive to hosting the king and his heirs if he is dethroned. Yes, but his majesty cannot wait too long. Who knows what parliament may do once he is ultimately in their hands. I believe the only hope is the king reaching some agreement with the Scots and raising any an army from there. Yet they do not seem as willing to help as they once were. Julian was about to reply when a rap came on the door. James Burroughs entered when Julian answered and said, Begging your pardon, sirs, but there is somewhat of a commotion in the kitchens, and Cook has sent me to ask you to come. I'm not sure what it's all about. At this, Julian and Richard arose and quickly made their way downstairs. Upon arriving in the kitchens, they saw several of the groundskeepers restraining an unkept, near-hysterical young girl. What on earth is all this? Julian demanded, looking from Esther to Gregory and back to the men. I think we found one of our thieves. They'd gotten clever and sent a girl. I'm not a thief! Uh, the girl cried. I need Master Julian's help. And at this, she wrestled out of the men's grasp and reached for Julian as if her life depended on it. Thoughts flashed through his mind of the day Catherine ran to him hysterical over her father, and he felt a sudden need to protect the girl, regardless of her circumstances. She resisted violently when the men attempted to haul her away from Julian, and he quickly waved them off and took the girl by the, shul the shoulders. Let her be, he said. Let her tell me what's wrong. They think I am a thief. I was only hiding in your stables. I am no thief, she cried. At this, Julian told the men to return to their stations, which they did without further comment. What is this about, girl? Did my men cause these bruises? Julian asked. No, no, but they thought I was a thief and were bringing me here for some awful punishment. I was only hiding, not stealing. I was told to come here if I was in danger, and Master Robert would help, but he is dead. There is only you. Please help me. She sobbed. And who are you, Robert? And who are you to Robert, child? Julian asked. 
utterly confused. He was my brother-in-law. In an avalanche of understanding, Julian realized it was Catherine's younger sister standing before him. The ride at Simon Shores came flooding back to him, during which Robert had told him about Catherine's siblings and how he was formulating a plan to bring them out of the blacksmith's cottage to establish a better life. It had all been lost with Robert's death and Catherine's departure, and he had forgotten the entire conversation. Now this beautiful young girl, hysterical with fear as Catherine once was, was here begging for his help. He felt the breath was knocked out of him and struggled to keep his composure. You're Catherine's sister. What is your name? He asked calmly as possible. Martin and Esther exchanged incredulous looks. Clarissa. Well, you must try to get a hold of yourself, Clarissa. I have expressed orders that your father is to stay far from the manor so he can do you no harm here. What is your brother's name? Matthew, she replied. He is only eight, much younger than me. Julian attempted to hide his smile at this brave young lady and her emphasis on the fact that she was much older than her sibling. And you are what? I will guess 14. I shall be 14 in February, she replied. Oh, please, Master Julian, there is no one to turn to. Everyone is gone and I have no one to help. Fearing she was getting beside herself again, he firmly said, no harm will come to you here, Clarissa. I give you my word on that child. Tell me, though, is your brother in danger now? No, he is in bed asleep. My father does not get angry with him very often, but he is always angry at me lately. He thinks I have gentleman callers, but he's not home, and says I do not behave properly when men come to the shop. I don't understand most of what he says, but I know I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm afraid to stay there any longer. Just try to calm yourself on the morrow, and I will see what can be done about your brother as well. I'll have a room prepared. Sarah, who had appeared at the start of the commotion, said she would have the lilac room made ready and find something for the girl to wear. Julian nodded, still immersed in his own tumultuous thoughts about the entire situation. Richard and Julian went off in search of Jennifer, and T Julian told Sarah that when the girl was settled and calm, he wished to speak to her. I heard the man was cruel and ran a tight household, but I never heard of him being violent until recently, Julian said to Jennifer after they told her what happened. Robert told me something of it weeks before he was killed, and it completely left my mind. We must get this other child to Matthew and bring him here as well. I want them to be educated by the vicar and perhaps a governess for Clarissa. They must be as members of the family. What is wrong with this madman to do this to Catherine and these poor children? These fanatical Puritans apparently believe you can somehow beat goodness into wives and children and that the more suffering one does, the saintlier he or she will become. Is the girl hurt badly? It looks as if she's taken several blows to the face. It was difficult to remain calm, seeing her battered in such a way. And by her own father... Catherine must have told her if the man became violent to come to the manor. Thank God she even came, though she knew Robert was dead. She asked for me by name, so I must have been mentioned as his brother. To where would she have gone otherwise? I can only imagine her fate. Robert spoke of another sister as well, who ran off to France with a lover. Who knows how that came out? When we retrieve the boy, Trafalgar must be made to leave this area. I don't care where he goes, but he will no longer get his living here. I should have done it long before now, and the others agreed. After an hour or so, Sarah told Julian that Clarissa was in the winter parlor. You look much better, child, Julian said after finding her there. I never had a dress like this in my life. Wait till Catherine sees. Where could she be, Master Julian? I never thought she would leave and not tell us where she was going. She should have sent a message. Clarissa stared at the floor. Well, he said softly, I suspect she sent a message to you before she left. It was likely intercepted by your father. I do have a detective at work to see if things came out satisfactorily and ease. I would do everything I can to find out if she is all right. He didn't add that she would probably still be at Briarwood if not for his unconscionable behavior. Well, please tell me what I can do here. I can go to work straight away and begin earning my room and board. Just like Catherine, Clarissa was resourceful and always determined to do the proper thing. Well, I understand, Julian began. However, I had something else in mind for you if you think you would like to hear about it. Of course, she said. I'll do whatever you want me to. Thank God she's here and not at the mercy of God knows who to be taken advantage of. It would please me greatly if you were to take lessons with a governess, and I would like to bring Matthew here as well. That way you will learn all the important things you need to know in this life. Would you like to earn your way by learning? To have an education as Catherine did? 
She was taught by the village rector before my father thought it was evil for women to learn. She secretly taught us as well. Well, you could take lessons with the rector, or I could install the governess. We can work all that out in the coming weeks. But you could spend most of your days in study and perhaps even learn some music. Catherine is quite good on the lute. Clarissa had been smiling, but suddenly paused for a moment. But how would that be? How, how would that help the household? I feel as if it, if it is me being offered a gift rather than paying you for your protection. He had to think quickly to get around this clever girl. Well, this is a large household, and when I marry and have children, they may need a governess, and you would be perfectly suited. If you are educated and properly trained, you would also be a wonderful companion for any of the ladies in the neighborhood. He knew he was merely lying to the girl, but he was afraid she may have a stubborn streak and refuse to take would, what would be considered charity. As time went on, he would explain to her that she was to be a member of the family, not a servant, but that was for later. All he cared about at the moment was satisfying the girl. Well, that would make me so happy then. She clasped her hands together, smiling through tears, and he had to look away because he was afraid of his own tears were near. Her face was, of course, washed, and she was properly dressed, but the signs of abuse were still evident, and, she, and he could not look at her fully without feeling overwhelmed with anger and pity. Then all is well, he said, and you must promise me you'll feel at home here and enjoy the manor. Everything is at your disposal. If you are hungry or need anything, just ask someone and you will be taken care of. The girl rose and came over to Jul where Julian was seated and dropped to her knees in front of his chair and kissed his hand. It's as if you were an angel taking over my case. Thank you so much, Master Julian. Now I shall get out from underfoot and be as quiet as a mouse. At this, Julian and Jennifer exchanged a look and unspoken words seemed to fill the room like people. Jennifer took Clarissa to the lilac room to get her settled and then ordered that something be prepared for her to eat. Julian later discovered that Catherine had indeed sent word to the home of her siblings, but the message must have been intercepted by their father, just as she, he suspected. However, he was pleased that at least he could honestly tell Clarissa that Catherine did not leave without a word to either child. She's a lovely and vivacious girl, said Jennifer, just after Clarissa was in bed and so full of life. You can see Catherine's beautiful bone structure. It's as if it's Catherine's face, but with auburn hair and green eyes. I find that amusing. I remember Catherine very well at that age, Julian said, and he couldn't hide a smile. Clarissa is another beauty, that is certain. When the time comes, we must find her a suitable husband who will love her as Robert loved Catherine. The boy Matthew must be educated as well and given a good start in life. It is what Robert would have done, and it is what I shall do. The following day, Julian sent for Ernest in the early hours of the morning, and he came to the manor, explaining that he had been to ease, to the address given to them by Sarah. And did you find this woman's home? Is Catherine safe and well? Aye, that I did. However, it was there that the trail grew cold. The woman had been dead for over eight months. A neighbor remembered an extraordinarily beautiful young lady stopping to inquire, which I must assume was Catherine, but no one knew where she went from there but she had talked of sending a message before she left. How could she have not done so and not discovered the woman no longer lived? Julian asked incredi incredulously. Perhaps she sent a message that she was on her way and did not wait for a reply. Did she say she left in a considerable haste? She did indeed. Did you follow up on any leads? There were none to follow up on, sir. As I said, the trail is cold. She did not say to the girl where she planned to go from there, nor did anyone else in the village, other than their neighbor, recalling, recall seeing her, but the neighbor did not speak to her. She merely overheard the conversation. She could not have vanished in the thin air, Julian said, growing irate. She must have gone somewhere to someone. Find out where. With that, he strode up from the room as if he could force as if he could force a different answer from the man by re-instructing him to complete the same task. When his footsteps died away, Richard turned to the investigator. It's difficult for him to face the fact that she must come back on her own or not at all. I understand, said the investigator, and I do not do want to, you to know that I realize how important a matter this is to him. It is just that I am at, at a loss. Even investigators must have some tiny shred of light with which to forge a trail, but the girl seems very well equipped to not be found. I would never have mentioned it to your brother-in-law, but I even checked vast rep reputable addresses in the surrounding villages and other locations where destitute women sometimes come to grief. No one answering her description was seen, and I feel certain that no one could have forgotten her. 
Though that's doubtful. I can't think where she might have gone if not to come back to Briarwood, but it's been more than an adequate time to return, if that's what she intended. I fear something catastrophic may have happened. With no protection, my no husband and no money, he stopped in mid-sentence. Well, said Ernest, I will certainly make further attempts to find at least a sliver of a, a lead with which to work. However, it seems doubtful that she would stay in a small village where she would be conspicuous if the only re living relative she knew there was gone. I will try Paris, the most obvious choice, if her next thought was to secure a position. But it is important for your brother-in-law to understand that it takes time to find a person in such an expansive region. If she is there, and even that is not certain, I will do my best to quell Julian's aggravation until you have visited France again. Clarissa was clearly an extraordinary young girl with a quick mind and even quicker wit and became a joy to everyone around her. For the first time since his brother's death, Julian felt as if he had at least somewhat made up for what he considered his great sin regarding Catherine. Even the village vicar had pleaded with him to forgive himself and accept God's forgiveness. Ne nevertheless, Julian still felt completely compelled to pay for his own sins, which of course he knew couldn't be done. He still imagined he were balancing the scales, though, to care for Catherine's family. At length, it was decided that they would snatch Matthew away quickly and deal with Blake afterwards, which led to another showdown on Briarwood property, and the man being banished from the vicinity. Legal he, legally, he could have offered. Legally, he could have fought to retrieve the chil children, but when Julian offered a substantial sum of gold, the wealth he claimed to have horse suddenly became more important than his own flesh and blood, which surprised no one. Well, I guess I've purchased children now, yet another offense added to my many sins, he told Jennifer. I don't care how you got them, she replied. They could not remain in that household. Of course, I've helped fund the parliamentary and army now, he said dryly. That's naturally where the money will go after he uses whatever he needs to relocate. It matters not. It was a solution. You did what had to be done, said his sister firmly. Clarissa, meanwhile, could be heard singing throughout the house sometimes, which brought a smile to the face of anyone within earshot. The family never ceased to marvel at her happy and flamboyant personality. The two younger children were very much alike and neither possessed Catherine's quiet demeanor, but were destined to be outgoing and headstrong. One day after Julian had interviewed a governess, he found a bit too meek for the theatrical Clarissa. Carissa approached him in his study. Julian, if you are quite through with the last interview, I have an idea for the youngsters. She sat down and told him, if you are not opposed to it, why should I not teach Clarissa and Matthew? At first, Julian was somewhat surprised, but before he had a chance to say anything, she went on. I know it may seem a bit unusual, but you know how Bernice... Landor taught her own children for a time when there was no suitable governess about, so it isn't as if it has never been done never done in families. Matthew has really taken to me, and Clarissa gets along with everyone i thought I thought I should like to do it if there's no opposition from anyone. I can't imagine anyone being against that idea. I think it would work quite well. It would certainly save me more unfruitful interviews, as you've said, Clarissa and Matthew are quite partial to you which is one of the biggest hurdles when it comes to persuading children to do their lessons. I don't have to be married with youngsters of my own to know that, he finished with a chuckle. I shall tell them now then, Karinza asked with a hopeful expression, and he realized how much it meant to her. Yes. Why should we not settle the matter at once? Of course, if it ever becomes burdensome or you prefer to turn it over to someone else, please simply let me know and we'll work it out at that time. When Carissa had left, Julian thought how pleased she seemed that he agreed with her idea and how such an activity might help to fill up the days. He thought it odd how Carissa never seemed inclined to try to marry, even though she was excellent in her still room and very helpful with domestic matters. It still wasn't much of a life for a young woman. Trust Catherine to touch them in a positive way, even after disappearing without a trace. At the latter thought, he plummeted back into despair but clung to the fact that she would never stay away from her sister and brother forever. She must return eventually for that reason, at which point, perhaps, he could speak to her in a less tumultuous setting. Catherine, I think perhaps there's something you haven't thought of with regard to your sudden malady. Monique began, her dark eyes filled with concern. No, Monique, I have been thinking of nothing but that for the past week, and I am almost certain that I am pregnant. 
if that was what you were about to say. Monique exhaled suddenly, almost as if she were holding her breath. Even though Catherine had been a married woman, there was still a veridity about her, and she wondered if the thought would come to her that her sudden morning illness was from the presence of an unborn child. Rebecca had also suspected that Catherine was pregnant, but not merely because of the physical symptoms. She noticed a difference in her over the last few weeks whenever they had occasion to spend time together, most recently at the engagement party of Rupert to his childhood sweetheart, Charlotte. Rebecca had taken note that Catherine was still sometimes sad and lapsed into deep melancholy, but she had suddenly come out of that initial lassitude that implied she almost didn't care what happened to her. Rebecca thought perhaps the presence of a baby was the cause. At the end of the next week, Catherine saw the village physician to confirm her suspicions. Monique insisted she would have her parents call a court physician, but Catherine refused. Their daughter was soon to be married to an important comte, they would not be expected to go chasing off after an expensive doctor for her lady's maid who was there to earn a living. She knew she couldn't impose herself on Monique in that way, even though she did consider her more of a friend than an employer. Often she thought with curiosity that their relationship was similar to the one she had with Sarah, only with the roles reversed. Oh, people are people everywhere, as Robert always said. She thanked Monique for her kind offer, but said that she must have time to consider what would be best. I certainly did not marry Robert for wealth, but this child is the heir to Briarwood, and I think must think of that too, for the baby's sake rather than my own. Monique wholeheartedly agreed. She had understood well Catherine's reasons for wanting to leave Briarwood, as she had explained to Monique the bitter conflict between her and Julian. Nevertheless, she knew the baby would change ev any everything. The next morning, Catherine stared out to the vineyards, realizing she must go. She had vexed her soul in search of a way to remain in France, but in the end, she knew she was defeated. Returning to Briarwood was her only hope. She could not expect a village midwife or an inexperienced country doctor to bring her safely through. She needed Dr. Lincroft or a court doctor and the care she would find at Briarwood. That I might may find at Briarwood, she corrected herself aloud, still staring out the window as if there were some answer in the landscape. Although Robert's son or daughter deserved the best she could give, and that was to be raised at the manor where he or she ultimately belonged. I must go back, she eventually whispered, her voice echoing eerily off the window pane. A few moments later, Benique entered the room. Francesca said you looked deep in thought when she passed by a few moments ago, Monique said, referring to her younger sister. I have a feeling you have decided. I have no choice. I'm going back, she said, her expression and tone imp passive always. I think it's the best decision for your sake as well as the child's. She had told Monique of her heart condition and she had kept her secret. But with the baby on the way, Catherine's young mistress was concerned that things might go wrong. I cannot even imagine the family's reaction, Catherine said. Yet you did say that Julian pleaded with you to stay when he made plans to depart. Monique replied optimistically. Do you think he was sincere? He seemed sincere when he said it, she replied, but I'm afraid he may have changed his mind a hundred times since then. Only God knows. He's very unpredictable. Either way, it will be too late once I arrive there. If they, do, if they turn me out, I do not know what will happen. You'll come straight back here, Monique replied emph emphatically, and the two women embraced, each of them knowing it may be for the last time. Saying goodbye to Rupert, Gerard, and Rebecca was difficult as well. Charlotte and Rupert said they were planning a visit to England, but would likely be unable to do so now because of the war. Rupert had relatives near London, and they promised to send a message if they ever made it there. Catherine thought that perhaps there was a better chance of her ending up back in France, given the rumors she had heard about the king's failing army, but would not allow herself to look that far into the future. Bearing a healthy child was the only thing that mattered to her in that moment, Robert's child, and she was unaware that a beautiful smile illuminated her face at the mere thought of it.